In this presentation, the block of scripture that we are going to consider is the last chapter of Mosiah, Mosiah chapter 29, and then chapters 1 through 4 in the book of Alma. So let's take a look at what it teaches us, some of the doctrines and principles that are found in these chapters. So first of all, we start out with Mosiah chapter 29. 29 verses 1 through 47. Here's an overview. Over 500 years had passed from the time that Lehi left Jerusalem and fled with this colony into the wilderness. It would appear that the government of the people for the first 30 years or so was patriar patriarchal in nature. Thus, then Nephi was appointed king and the Nephite monarchy began, a system which was perpetuated until the end of the ministry of King Mosiah. Since his own sons had refused to succeed him and thus assume kingly leadership, they had, as a result of their conversion, assumed instead their priestly responsibilities to preach the gospel to the Lamanites. Mosiah proposed an alternative plan or mode of government for the Nephite nation, knowing full well the evils of a wicked king and that it is the nature and disposition of almost all men as soon as they get a little authority as they suppose to begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. Mosiah suggested that the people forsake a government by kings and set up a hierarchy of elected judges whereby political and social injustices and equity might more readily be exposed and corrected. Mosiah's counsel was that since it is not common that the voice of the people desireth anything contrary to that which is right, the Nephite should, in his language, observe and make it your law to do your business by the voice of the people. Though the judges were to be elected by the voice of the people, the Nephites were to be governed according to the laws which had been given by our fathers, which are correct and which were given by them by the hand of the Lord. King Mosiah knew from personal experience the loneliness and the bitter burdens of a monarchy. He had felt all the trials and troubles of a righteous king, yea, all the travails of the soul for the people, and also the murmurings of the people to their king. He sensed that these things ought not to be, but that the burden should come upon all people, that every man might bear his part. This was a system of government which might be called theodemocratic, in the sense that the voice of the people, as well as the word and will of the Lord, would form the basis for decisions made and laws instituted. Theocratic government traces their origins to the earliest ages. Adam, our father, the first man, Elder Bruce R. McConkie has written, is the presiding high priest over the earth for all ages. The government the Lord gave him was patriarchal, and from the expulsion from Eden to the cleansing of the water, earth by water in the days of Noah, the righteous portion of mankind were blessed and governed by a patriarchal theocracy. This theocratic government so our system, patterned after the order and system that prevailed in heaven, was the government of God. He himself, though dwelling in heaven, was the lawgiver, judge, and king. He gave direction in all things, both civil and ecclesiastic. That was, there was no separation of church and state as we now know it. All governmental affairs were directed, controlled, and regulated from on high. The Lord's legal administrators on earth served as virtue by their calling and ordination the holy priesthood, and as they were guided by the power of the Holy Ghost. End of Elder McConkie's quote. In speaking of the children of Israel under Moses, Joseph Smith explained, quote, Their government was a theocracy. They had God to make their laws, and the men chose by, chosen by him to administer them, he was their God, and they were his people. Moses received the word of the Lord from God himself. He was the mouth of God to Aaron, and Aaron taught the people both civic and ecclesiastical affairs. They were both one. There was no distinction. End of quote. Presumably, the Nephites' theodemocracy was not unlike the ancient theocracy. Alma was appointed to be the first chief judge and governor over the land, and was at the same time the high priest over the church, having been called to serve as successor to his father in the latter capacity. 
There were some distinctions between civil and ecclesiastical matters, as in the case of the adoption and perpetuation of falsehood or doctrinal error practices which were declared to be beyond the scope of the civil law. But for the most part, their judges were men not only with political acumen, but also with priestly and pathetic stature. The chief judge received his office with soberness, with an oath and sacred ordinance to judge righteously and keep the peace and the freedom of the people, and to grant unto them their sacred privileges, to worship the Lord their God, yea, to support and maintain the cause of God all his days, and to bring the wicked to justice according to their crimes. That's according to Alma 50:39. So with that, let's turn to Alma, I'm sorry, Mosiah chapter 29, verse 20, the phrase extending the arm of mercy towards them that put their trust in him meant, mercy claimeth the penitent, and mercy cometh because of the atonement. Christ has indeed risen from the dead that he might bring all men unto him on conditions of repentance. Thus, mercy is not unconditional. That is what we need to learn from this verse. Mercy is only conditioned upon repentance. If you do not repent, then the laws of justice must apply and punishment and the judgments of God must come. If you want mercy, it is conditional upon the conditions of repentance to access the atonement of Christ. 29 verses 26 to 27, the phrase, the danger of the majority choosing that which is not right. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, warned that we must not be indifferent to wickedness in society because destruction awaits nations that choose unrighteousness. Elder Maxwell said, quote, speaking behaviorally, when what was once the lesser voice of the people became more dominant, then the judgments of God and the consequences of foolish selfishness follow. Cultural decline is accelerated when single interest segments of society become indifferent to general values once widely shared. This drift is facilitated by the indifferent or the indulgent as, as society is led carefully down to hell. Some may not join in this drift, but instead they step aside, whereas once they might have constrained as, in their as is their representative right. We actually have an obligation to notice genuine telltale societal signs. For what happens in culture decline, both leaders and followers are really accountable. Historically, of course, it is easy to criticize bad leaders, but we should not give followers a free pass. Otherwise, in their rationalization of their degeneration, they may say they were just following orders, while the leaders were just ordering followers. However, much more is required of followers in a democratic society, wherein individual character matters so much in both leaders and followers. End of quote. Brothers and sisters, we cannot excuse the decline we see right now in our society just on bad leaders. That certainly is the case. But we as followers must choose righteousness and stand up for the right and not follow bad leaders. We will not be justified in doing that. President Boyd K. Packer also spoke of the recent trends of distorting tolerance. He said, quote, The virtue of tolerance has been distorted and elevated to a position of such prominence as to be thought equal to and even valued more than morality. It is one thing to be tolerant, even forgiving of individual conduct. It is quite another to collectively legislate and legalize to protect immoral conduct that can weaken and even destroy the family. Now, breaking from his quote for a minute, that means, yes, we are to be tolerant of individual peoples, but we are not to tolerate a sinful and immoral society. We have obligations to stand up and take a stand. Back to Elder Packer's quote. 
There is a dangerous trap when tolerance is exaggerated to protect the rights of those whose conduct endangers the family and injures the rights of the more part of the people. We are getting dangerously close to the condition described by the prophet Mosiah. End of quote. Brothers and sisters, we do not tolerate legislation that promotes wickedness. We do not have to tolerate that. We are to take a stand and stand for righteousness. When it is the when, when, it, when it is the case that the voice of the people no longer choose good, when the majority of the inhabitants of a nation turn from God of Israel and worship instead the gods of wood and stone or riches and popularity, then that nation is said to have ripened in iniquity and is pursuing a course which will result in its eventual destruction. In other words, we don't have to tolerate that. In speaking to the wicked people of Ammonihah, Amulek said, If it were not for the prayers of the righteous who are now in the land, that ye should even now be visited with utter destruction, by famine and by pestilence and the sword. But it is by the prayers of the righteous that ye are spared. Now therefore, if ye will cast out the righteous from among you, then will not the Lord stay his hand? But in his fierce anger he will come out against you. End of Amalekai. In writing specifically of the land of America, Moroni warned, quote, And now we can behold the decrees of God concerning this land, that it is a prom land of promise, and whatsoever nation shall possess it shall serve God, or they shall be swept off when the fullness of his wrath shall come upon them, and the fullness of his wrath cometh upon them when they are ripened in iniquity, end of quote. Brothers and sisters, our nation, America, is certainly approaching being ripened in iniquity. We as the righteous must take a stand. Chapter 29, verse 34, the phrase, The burden should not come upon all people, that every man... The burden should come upon all the people, that every man might bear his part, meant... We believe that governments were instituted of God for the benefit of man and that he holds men accountable for their acts in relation to them, both in making laws and administering them for the good and safety of society, as it says in Doctrine and Covenants 134.1. Further, the responsibility for identifying and selecting good men and women to represent them and serve them in government rests with the people. We will be held accountable for that, brothers and sisters. To the saints of the latter days, the master said, I, the Lord God, make you free. Therefore, ye are free indeed, and the law also maketh you free. Nevertheless, when the wicked rule, the people mourn. We will not be justified in saying, oh, I didn't know they were that wicked. We have to do our research and our work. If we vote in wicked people under wicked political parties, then we are just as responsible for their wicked actions. We are giving them permission. And so we will be held accountable for the actions that they commit if we vote in such people. Be careful who you vote for because you are responsible personally for the actions that they take in government. The master said, I, the Lord God, make you free indeed. Therefore, you are free indeed, and the law also makes you free. Nevertheless, when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Wherefore, honest men and wise men should be sought for, sought for diligently, and good men and wise men ye should observe to uphold. Otherwise, whatsoever is less than this cometh of evil. Therefore, if we choose by our vote unrighteous people to represent us, then we are just as accountable for their unrighteousness and the judgments of God that will follow. Then we too are not excused from iniquity if elected officials we elect undertake to cover their sins or to gratify their pride, their vain ambition, or to exercise control or dominion or compulsion upon the souls of the children of men in any degree of unrighteousness. If we vote in men or women that do that, then we are just as accountable of breaking that in Doctrine and Covenants 121 verse 37 as if we were personally doing it. Voting for righteous women and men is a very serious matter. If you vote in people who break, take to cover their pride, 
gratify their pride, take vain ambition to exercise control and dominion. And we certainly have people doing that. Even our current president is breaking every one of those things in 121 verse 37. Those who voted for him are held accountable for him breaking all of those things to cover their sins, to gratify their pride and their vain ambition, and to exercise unrighteous dominion or compulsion, to compel people to take a shot in their body that they do not want to take. That was legally compelled. Those who voted for that man who made that law and compelled people to take shots, you are personally also held accountable. Thus, who we vote for becomes critical for what they do as representatives in our behalf is the same as if we are doing it. Be careful of who you vote for. That is one way that many of us will break Doctrine and Covenants 121.37. 29 verses 41 through 44, the reign of the judges. The change in the government instituted through King Mosiah was so significant that from then until the birth of Christ, the Nephites recorded their time in relation to the beginning of the reign of the judges. Previously, the Nephites kept track of time from the year Lehi left Jerusalem. Okay, now let's turn our attention to the book of Alma. By way of introduction, in the book of Alma, we encounter some of the most profound of all messages of the nephite Jaredite record. We watch and listen as a converted Alma and the sons of Mosiah preach the gospel of power and persuasion to both the Nephites and the Lamanites. We reflect and ponder upon the unparalleled witness of Christ and the atonement sent forth by the ancient apostles. We read with deep appreciation as Alma and his missionary associates deliver the doctrine of Christ to the apostate Zoran thereby leaving behind priceless doctrinal gems of everlasting worth. We sorrow with Alma as he, dis as he discourses on the doctrines of salvation to an errant son, but we glory in the fact that the declaration of doctrine in the spirit of pure testimony is our surest check on waywardness and immorality. We witness the hand of God in dealing in leading his people into defensive wars, and we reflect soberly upon the external verity that only those who trust in and rely upon God of the land, Jesus Christ, enjoy his approbation and his favor. As compiler of the Book of Mormon, Mormon faced difficult challenges in determining what to include in the abridged record. At least two directives guided his selection. First, the Lord told Mormon to write the things which have been commanded. Second, Mormon saw our day and conditions that would exist. We understand then that when Mormon made editorial decisions, these two factors were his governing concerns. It is instructive to compare the length of the books in the Book of Mormon and the time periods they covered. The inordinate amount of writing for a rather small period of history alerts the reader that the time of Book of Mormon history covered by the Book of Alma is especially parallel and relevant, relevant for our time. So with that, let's now go to Alma chapter 1. Alma 1 verse 1, the phrase, Having warred a good warfare. King Mosiah had fought against wickedness and battled Beelzebub all his days. He had been true and faithful to his trust to lead his people in the paths of truth and righteousness. He had passed the test of mortality. His salvation was secure. He was like his colleague on another continent, Paul the Apostle, who said just prior to his death, "'All have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith.'" Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the judge, righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not only me, but unto all them that also that love his appearing. End of quote. Chapter 1, verse 3, the phrase, that which he termed to be the word of God meant indeed what he spoke was not the word of God, but it was what would have wished the word of God to be. The perverse and the malicious frequently devise their own form of divinity, conjure up their own words of truth, and create their own sets of values. 
They then blasphemy against divine order by stating that their views are heaven sent and have God's approbation. We, there is no such thing as my truth. So this phrase, that which he termed to be the word of God. No, truth is truth independent. There is no such thing as my truth. There is the truth, the truth of God. They struggled with that concept. People claiming, well, my truth is this, and it's just as valid as yours. And Mormons saw in our day that we would have people that say the same thing. No, there is the truth and the truth of God, and that is what we would be accountable for. The phrase bearing down against the church meant how often the true church is the object of ridicule and the target of the fiery darts of the adversary. The church of Jesus Christ is the custodian of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and thus the only place where the ordinance of salvation may be found. When the kingdom of God is established on earth, when the church has been restored, when the necessary priesthood and keys and authorities have been bestowed, when these conditions are obtained, man time mankind will come unto Christ and thus unto salvation through the statutes and ordinances of the church or they will not enjoy the blessings of heaven though the church is but the means to an end Christ is the end a person deceives himself who supposes that he can enjoy the benefits and privileges of the gospel in this life without being active and involved in the living church the phrase every priest and teacher ought to become popular referred to. Here is pre priestcraft at its best. Nephi had declared centuries earlier, priestcrafts are that men preach and set themselves up for a light unto the world that they may get gain in the praise of the world, but they seek not the welfare of Zion. One possessed of the spirit of priestcraft is eager to gain attention eager to receive the applause of the crowd, eager for recognition and reward. He or she seeks a following and does so for all the wrong reasons. He or she preaches, in some cases even preaches the truth, for money or for fame, not for the establishment of Zion, to print books and make money, even off true doctrine. What is their motive for writing such books? What is the motive for me making this commentary on YouTube? I do it to help people center and come into Christ. I make no money and seek no gain from it except for the praise of Christ and bringing people closer to Christ. Such persons are motivated by mammon driven by desire, impelled by impulse, and prompted by the quest for prominence. Elder L. Tom Perry, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, urges to have the courage to reject modern-day knee whores. See, it was knee whore that said that teachers and priests should be paid. And their popular messages. Quote, Elder Perry said, knee whore's words appealed to the people. But his doctrine, while popular to many, was incorrect. As we face the many decisions in life, the easy and popular messages of the world will not usually be the right ones to choose, and it will take much courage to choose the right. End of quote. Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles instructed gospel teachers to look to the Savior and to help their students do the same. Quote, a gospel teacher will never obscure students' view of the master by standing in the way or by shadowing the lesson with self-promotion or self-interest. This means that a gospel teacher must never indulge in priestcrafts, which are that the men preach and set themselves up for a light into the world, that they may get gain and praise of the world. A gospel teacher does not preach to become popular or for the sake of riches and honor, nor do you write books and sell them at Deseret Book for that purpose. He or she follows God, the marvels the marvelous Book of Mormon example, in which the preacher was no better than the hearer, neither was the teacher any better than the learner. Both will always look to the master. There is nothing wrong with some of the commentaries that are written 
at Deseret Book or buying them and studying them. What I'm claiming is those who make them, what is their motive? They will be held accountable if they are trying to preach for popularity, for to get gain in either fame or monetary means. Chapter 1, verse 4. The phrase that all mankind should be saved at the last day and that they need not fear nor tremble referred to, Nehor's doctrine would be very popular among many of our own day. He obviously did not believe in a fall from which mankind required redemption. He advocated some form of hum humanism, the pernicious belief that men and women have but to fulfill their genetic blueprint in order to be happy, for they are by nature good and noble, having no need for divine assistance. As we will see later in the story, in the main, the people of Ammonihah, a perverse lot given over to the profession of Nehor, repented not of their sins, for they were of the profession of Nehor, and they did not believe in the repentance of their sins. Nehor taught that the people that they should lift up their heads, that is, lift up their heads in their wickedness. He surely preached against guilt and shame and judgment. Like his master Lucifer, his program propounded the pernicious but popular belief that all mankind would eventually be saved without righteousness, without faith, without atonement, and repentance. And I would add, which is popular, Dave, all mankind will be saved because God loves us. No, brothers and sisters, God can love you as much in the celestial kingdom as he can in the celestial kingdom. God is not going to save us just because he loves us. His doctrine had been for foreseen by ancient Nephi prophets. Nephi had warned, and there shall also be many which shall say, Eat, drink, and be many. Mary, nevertheless, fear God, for he will justify in committing a little sin. Yea, lie a little, take the advantage of one because of his words, dig a pit for the neighbor, for there is no harm in this, and doing all these things, for tomorrow we die. And if it so be that we are guilty, God will beat us with a few stripes, and at last we shall be saved in the kingdom of God. Such false doctrine is popular today. The teachings of Nehor are still being taught today. Chapter 1 verse 5. Many to believe on his words, Nehor's. Why would people believe him? How could he seduce so many? Perhaps it was because his system of salvation was so easy, his promise of eternal reward so attractive, his demands so few. He denied prophecy and revelation and thus found no place for absolute values nor absolute truth. Like his counterpart Korahor, his doctrine was pleasing unto the carnal mind. That's where many get caught up and the trap comes. Chapter 1, verse 6. The phrase, he began to be lifted up in the pride of his heart to wear very costly apparel. Here was an obvious sign of his apostasy an evidence that his heart was impure. Costly apparel is symbolic of submission to the world's standards and acquiescence to the allurements of appearance. Isn't that interesting? The Book of Mormon constantly talk about the wicked finally turn their hearts to wear not just nice clothes, but costly apparel as a sign of their status above people, as it says here, their submission that they have submitted to worldly standards. The phrase to establish a church after the manner of his preachings, Nehor's meant, in the true church, doctrines and beliefs and practices are based not upon the whims and the ways of the congregation, or even of its leaders, but rather upon prophecy and revelation, truth upon upon truth, upon things as they were and are and are to come. False churches are built upon false principles and false practices. They are more a reflection of ephemeral, short-lived values and re relativistic ritual than of reality. Chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, Gideon, who was an instrument in the hands of God. Gideon, a noble and faithful servant of God and of the people, now weighed down with years, sought to withstand Nehor with the power of the word. And nothing is more abhorrent to the immoral and the perverse than the truth. 
pure diamond truth. It cuts the wicked to the core of their being, and thus they fight it with vicious and often irrational anger. Boy, you see that today. Unable to stand up and defend his falsehoods in the face of truth spoken with power and conviction, Nehor sought to silence his accuser. When confronted by Nehor's false teachings, Gideon admonished Nehor with the words of God. As a result, Gideon was slain for defending the faith. This captain, teacher, and martyr was so respected by the people that they named both a valley and a city in his honor. He was now a very old man and in physical combat was not equal to one who was large and who was noted for his great strength. Nehor drew his sword and undermined and unmindful of Gideon's age, nor of his many virtues, smote him until he was dead. He died. Nehor thought that might is right, and that his finery and his prowess in contending with the sword would excuse his rash conduct. But in this he was mistaken. Chapter 1, verses 1, 10 through 11. The phrase Nehor was taken by the people of the church. Nehor was taken before the chief judge Alma by some church members and was tried for his willful and unprovoked crime. He was he made himself be, be he made himself being his own advocate a bold defense of his actions and without any doubts pleaded that he had been purposely uh, aggravated by Gideon as if that justified his actions. Verse, chapter 1, verse 12, the first time that priestcraft had been introduced, referred to. Though Nephi had defined priestcraft and warned of its consequences more than four centuries earlier, it appears that Nehor was the first in the Nephite society to put it into practice, and in his case, he sought to enforce it through a cruel murder. Alma, apparently shaken by the effrontery of Nehor and his justification of the internal and reprehensible act, intentional and reprehensible act of which he was accused, found him guilty of not only slaying Gideon, who was a man without blame, who was a man without blameworthiness, but was also a criminal responsible in introducing priestcraft among this people and of attempting to enforce it by the sword. Alma concluded this part of his decision by stating that if such a procedure was allowed to continue, it would be the source of great contention among the people, and that if they were co coerced or compelled to uphold any pretender like Nehor with their worldly goods as well as to believe their teachings, they might themselves take up arms. This would in the end destroy the entire people because they were those who under no circumstance would deny the holy prophets. If death was the reward of faithful observance of God's laws, there were many among them ready and willing to accept it. They would prefer it to denying the teachings of his revealed church. Brothers and sisters, do we have people today compelling by legislation and laws to compel you to live certain ways so that certain people can have power? What do you think the whole climate change thing is about? Don't you think God knew that we would have fossil fuels? And he provided them so that we could have energy, cheap energy. This whole climate change thing is just a man-made crisis so that people can control and compel by legislation people. That is unrighteousness. No wonder Mormon included these things in the Book of Mormon. We are seeing the same things being enacted today. And what I mean by climate change, I mean those who preach it as this apocalyptic thing that's going to happen in 12 years. And therefore, we must be forced into certain laws. Of course, the climate change is called winter, fall, spring, and summer. Priestcraft means not only crafty and wicked ruse to lead others astray, but also the making a religion, a profession, in which the aim is to obtain worldly honor, gold, silver, and the platitudes of men. See, some of those who push the climate change crisis have turned it into a religion. 
A civilization that wastes its strength in the pursuit of either wealth or glory will not stand. A nation that fosters or encourages selfishness that allows greed and lust to go unchecked will sink under its own weight. Babylon will fall because its citizenry will come in time to shun and hate and destroy all that oppose them. Zion will rise and shine forth and in Zion to the nation because its misappropriation municipals seek the interest of their neighbors and doing all things with an eye single to the glory of God. The only true antidote to priestcraft is charity. Chapter 1, verses 14 through 15, the phrase, Therefore thou art contemned to die. Nehor had taken a man's life, and according to the laws of God and man, his own life was required. God does approve, under certain circumstances, the death penalty. The people had accepted those laws, and therefore they were compelled to abide them. Otherwise, the government of which they were part would collapse as being without effect and would be impotent. The phrase, he suffered an ignominious death, meant, the scriptures say he suffered an ignominious death, which means very shameful, reproachful, dishonorable. At the place where Nephor died, he confessed that the things he had taught to the people were false and were contrary to the word of God. Manti, the name of the hill where Nephor was executed, is a word that is to be found in ancient Egypt. The name is also found in numerous places in geography of both North and South America. Isn't that interesting? How would Joseph Smith have known that and gotten the name Manti right? He translated it by the gift and power of God. He didn't just guess right. Chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, the phrase, Nevertheless, the death of Nephor did not put an end to the preaching of priestcraft throughout the land. Though Nehor's shameful life was thus ended, unfortunately his doctrine did not die with him. It was too pleasant to those who desired to gain a home in the eternal abode in spite of a life of sinful joys and follies. Consequently, it spread wildly through the teachings of his followers. The law under which they had recourse in teaching their pernicious doctrines was one that assured to them religious freedom or liberty. The, the law said that you had religious freedom, so you could not be punished for your belief. The law was made to protect the innocent, but some found it in a convenient way to take refuge when to hide their own deceit suited their purposes best. To be proven false was to be branded with the mark of infamy, and those who dared lie were in danger of the law prohibiting it. Punishment for this crime was keen and sure. There was a law against lying. However, there was one recourse, one we call a loophole, that enabled many to escape punishment for their acts. Religious liberty was a sacred right among the Nephites. No one could be in jeopardy of the law by stating his or her own beliefs. The followers of Nephor's teachings contended that they believed all things they taught and therefore could not be accused of advocating that which they knew to be false because they claimed to be their religion and there was religious freedom. This part of the statute of the newborn republic excused many of the charge of spreading untruths or falsely swearing. Later we shall see in the historic portions of the Book of Mormon the story of the traitorous Amalekites, the apostate Amalekites, the bloodthirsty Amulonites, and the Ammonihaites, that all these faithless deserters from the church of God are those who embrace the teachings of Nehor. In all the lessons of the people of the land have learned, in all the instructions they have received from experience, none are more vividly noted than the bitter hatred, the inexhaustible spite, the bloodthirstiness and hard hardness hearts of those enemies of the church of God who were once numbered among its faithful. Is it interesting? It's always the apostates that have the hardest hearts, not those outside the church. The Book of Mormon often speaks of them as being after the order of Nephor. We imagine that to belong to that order required conformity to certain unholy covenants and to take other vicious and immoral oaths. The Nephite Republic had laws penalizing those who robbed, those who stole from another, and those who committed murder and whoredoms. Murder was punished by death. The law of God is, whoever sheddeth man's blood, 
By him shall his blood be shed, it said in Genesis 9-6. In 1889, the First Presidency of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles prepared a declaration regarding the church position on capital punishment. Quote, we solemnly make the following declaration that this church views the shedding of human blood with the utmost abhorrence that we regard the killing of human beings except in conformity with the civil laws as a capital crime which should be punished by shedding the blood of the criminal after a public trial before a legally constituted court of the land. The revelations of God to this church make death the penalty for capital crime and requirement and require the offender's the offenders against life and property shall be delivered up and tried by the laws of the land. End of quote. Chapter one, verse sixteen. The phrase "many who loved the vain, many who loved the vain things of the world." Vain things are shallow, hollow, hollow, empty, and worthless. They offer glitter and sparkle and pizzazz, but can promise no lasting reward. So many people of this world crave popularity, praise, and public acclaim. Such persons never know the security and sacred satisfaction which come from divine approval, nor ironically can they appease their inner hunger for celestial society, societal for celestial societal sociality, I'm sorry, the need for caring friends and loved ones. So many people of this world lust after money and exhaust their strength in their quest for this world's goods. Such persons never know the quiet prosperity of the spirit, the wealth of wisdom that comes from seeking first the kingdom of God or the riches of eternity that are available to a single-minded disciple. The phrase in verse 16, preach false doctrines for the sake of riches and honor, meant occasionally false doctrine is disseminated by the hopelessly ignorant, those who make but feeble effort to discover and learn the truth. It is also presented and perpetuated by the proud and self-vaunting ones, those who read after the lamp of their own conceit. And of course, falsehood is made available by those by those more interested in filling their coffers than filling a need. Those obsessed more with graft than with goodness. Chapter 17, the phrase, liars were punished, meant it would be interesting to know exactly how liars were handled among the Levites. We would suppose that unrepentant liars who had membership in the church were dealt with in harmony with the principles found in modern revelation which says, quote, Thou shall not lie. The Lord commanded in 1831, He that lieth and will not repent shall be cast out, that is, cut off from the church, as communicated. It's found in DNC 4221. In the end, of course, liars will be thrust down to hell in the post-mortal spirit world and will inherit a telestial kingdom in eternity. The phrase in chapter 17, The law could have no power on any man for his belief. Although one could believe as one pleased, it appears that when one's false teachings were translated into actions that violated the law of society, such a person was liable to prosecution. See the episode of Korhor with Alma in Alma 30, 18-21. Chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, the phrase, Whosoever did not belong to the church of God began to persecute those that did belong to the church. Meant, as the night follows the day, so also does ridicule and persecution follow the true church. Darkness cannot tolerate light, and the prince of darkness certainly has no regard for those who have taken upon themselves the name of the Lord of light. It is bitter irony that those who choose to traverse the broad roads of worldliness cannot rest while some who seek to navigate the straight and narrow course of eternal life. Nothing brings greater discomfort to the perverse than it be in the presence of the pure. Nothing alarms and aggravates the haughty and the pompous more than the humble and the contrite. And surely nothing incenses the p p practitioner of prefcrass more than witnessing the self-service of one whose eye is single to the glory. Of God. In every dispensation of the gospel, whenever the people of the Lord abide, the antagonism that exists between the forces of good and evil find expression in the lives of those who deride the good and deny the truth. These forces contain, continually oppose each other. 
They are at war. The word war to some may sound extreme, but it is not. The war in heaven is a point of view. There, even before the earth was created, Lucifer, the son of the morning, led the rebellious and those who sought to upsert the power and authority of God, I'm sorry, usurp, to utter defeat. He was the leader of one third of the hosts of heavenly hosts and leads those who today clamor against the righteous and revile against good and the pure. Lucifer and his followers were cast out from heaven and he became Satan. They continue even now the rebellion and attempted usurpation. Men inspired by Satan, unholy desires, persecute the meek and seek to breed into naught the purposes of the Lord. It appears that in the heritage of the faithful there is persecution. We need not be surprised at this, for we know there are many blessings that await those who are faithful and endure to the end. And this is not all. True believers in Christ become stronger in their faith when they pass through affliction. When the great bellows of an adversary will almost overwhelm them, they rise to unprecedented heights of courage and fortitude. They remember the pains of their Redeemer, and resolve their trials, notwithstanding to be steadfast and immovable in keeping the commandments of the Lord. False teachers began to increase among the Nephites. Most of them were followers of Nehor. Class and class distinction and social division developed rapidly in their midst. Those who loved the vain things of the world became the ready adherents to deceit and treachery. They became proud and overbearing and bitter in their feelings toward members of the Church of Christ. Because of the humility and meekness of its believers, the unbelievers scornfully afflicted them with all manner of words. But the faithful, un mindful of the wrath and the belligerency of their opponents, labored unceasingly to minister to their wants of their fellows. The sacred record says they did impart of the word of God one with another without money and without price. President Harold Bealey admonished those who are persecuted neither to allow their trials to stop their spiritual progression nor to deter their zeal. He said, quote, to be persecuted for righteousness' sake in a great cause where truth and virtue and honor are at stake is godlike. The great harm that may come from persecution is not from the persecution itself, but from the possible effect it may have upon the persecuted, who may thereby be deterred in their zeal for their righteousness of their cause. Much of that persecution comes from lack of understanding, for men are prone to oppose that which they do not comprehend. Some of it comes from men intent upon evil, but from whatever cause, persecution seems to be so universal against those engaged in a righteous cause. If you stand firmly for the right, despite the jeers of the crowd or even physical violence, you will be crowned with the blessedness of eternal joy. Who knows but that again in our day some of the saints or even apostles in the former days may be required to give their lives in defense of the truth. If that time should come, God grant they would not fail. End of quote. Chapter 1, verses 21 through 24, the phrase, the law of the church regarding persecution. The saints of the Most High are called to declare the glad tidings of the gospel. They are not called to malign or attack the faith and religious persuasion of others. Truth stands on its own and does not require the cheap crutch of criticism of alternate systems of belief. In the words of Elder Marvin J. Ashton, quote, We have no time for contention. We only have time to be about our Father's business. End of quote. Further, members of the Church of Christ are counseled. Strengthen your brethren in all your conversation, in all your prayers, in all your exhortations, and all your doings. I do not have to contend with false teachings of others to stand up for Christ. Christ can take care of his own. Christ is a big enough person that he can defend his doctrines himself. We do not have to go on contention to do that. It is the spirit of pride that motivates some of the saints to condemn warmly with non-members, to argue and debate the meaning of Scripture, to fight and quarrel with those of Father's children who might choose not to affiliate with the true church. Such a spirit is not of God, but is indeed of the devil who stirs up people to contend with one 
with one with another. Even though our message to the world is true, even though we declare, we'll, even though what we declare will sanctify and save all who accept and follow it, even though the Lord himself is in this work, notwithstanding all this, the Spirit cannot and will not abide those who seek by argument or heated discussion to establish the truth of spiritual matters. We teach and we testify. We bear witness. We speak with all the sobriety and sincerity we can muster. We plead with our listeners to give heed to our words, to ponder them, and to petition the heavens, to ascertain the truth, but we do not contend. Those church members who do not take the proper course in this regard, who argue endlessly and quarrel tirelessly, especially online, we could say today, those lose the Spirit of God and become an easy prey to the arch deceiver. Before they are aware, they lose their souls. That the, hearer, that the hearts of many were hardened was a great sorrow to Alma, who was president of the church, and their refusal, refusal to be guided by his counsel adds to his trials. In rejecting him as their leader, they served on him. They served on him a direct notice of their withdrawal from communion within the church. Nevertheless, those who remained true to God's holy laws showed their patience and firmness under affliction by fault for faithfully promoting whatsoever the, the Lord required of them. Chapter 1, verse 25, the phrase, A great trial to those that did stand fast in the faith, referred to. It is not easy to stand by and watch friends and loved ones, formerly members of the household of faith, lose the spirit and eventually forsake the faith. It is painful to observe people as they spiritually self-destruct. But after all effort to plead and persuade have failed, we must allow for individual agency, and we must bear with patience the persecutions and taunts of others. In verse 25, the phrase, they were steadfast and immovable, meant steadfastness is a sign of spiritual maturity, an evidence that one is on, that one is on the even course that leads to salvation. To be immovable in unrighteousness is to be consistent when it comes to matters of values and faith and courage. To be immovable is to have an allegiance to principles that is independent of circumstance and situations. It is to be firm in one's commitment to the truth, steady in one's loyalty to eternal verities. Chapter 1, verse 26, the phrase, The people also left their labors to hear the word of God. Edification is a form of spiritual education that is perfected as both speaker and hearer approach the class or sermon with joint preparation. When the speaker seeks the influence of the Spirit and delivers his or her message by the, that power, and at the same time the listener seeks the Spirit and receives the message by that same sacred influence, both are edified and rejoice together. The phrase, the priest, not esteeming himself above his hearers, meant, In the Lord's church, the members are a congregation of equals. There, no, there are no degrees, no academic titles, no worldly attainment that separate members of the group. The gospel has been restored in our day. For example, that every man and woman may speak in the name of the Lord, even the Savior of the world. The bishop, perhaps, is a plumber, while his clerk is the vice president of the Lord's corpor cor corporation. The state president is a farmer, while his high council is composed of lawyers and physicians and professors. Brothers and sisters, the other thing that we need to stop in this church is giving credence to different callings in the church. There is no calling that is better than another. We must stop this when it comes to apostles, prophets, pastors, priests, high priests, state presidents, or bishops. That does not make them better than anyone else. Let's stop putting a societal price on a position of a church position. That is just as wrong. Chapter 1, verse 27, the phrase, and they did imparted their substance. Oneness in spirit, in spirit leads eventually to oneness in social relations, oneness in regard to this world's goods and resources. As the people of God labor to acquire the gift and callings of God, they come to know and experience the fruit of the Spirit. They come to love, truly love their neighbor as themselves. The Savior 
instructed the Latter-day Saints, and now verily, verily, I say unto thee, put your trust in that spirit which leadeth to do good, yea, to do justly, to walk humbly, to judge righteously, and this is my spirit. The phrase, they did not wear costly apparel, meant one of the telltale signs of creeping apostasy among the Nephites, and by extension, that of any civilization which would be ours, is their obsession with costly apparel. Isn't that interesting? Not just with apparel, but costly apparel. It is noteworthy that the text solemnly mentions the beauty or appearance of the clothing. Not all, it is noteworthy that the text seldom mentions the beauty or the appearance of the clothing, only that it costs much. When form has replaced function to such a degree that a people place a premium upon those things that are the most expensive, then their appreciation for that which matters most is fading rapidly. On the other hand, when a people like the Nephites, at this period in their history, choose to be pleasant in appearance, to be neat and comely, not being obsessed with fleeting fashions and fads, then they have established proper priorities and will enjoy the approbation of heaven. As Dr. 42, 42 says, And again thou shalt not be proud in thy heart. The Lord declared, Let all thy garments be plain, and their beauty the beauty of the work of thine own hands. The Book of Mormon repeatedly warns against the sins of pride and class distinction that are manifest when people begin to wear very costly apparel. Members of the Lord's Church have been counseled to avoid extremes in clothing and appearance. They also avoid becoming preoccupied with expensive fashions. Nevertheless, disciples of Christ are to be neat and comely. The, for the strength of the youth pamphlet states, when you are well-groomed and modestly dressed, you invite the companionship of the Spirit. Always be neat and clean and avoid being sloppy or inappropriately casual in dress, grooming, and manners. Ask yourself, if would I feel comfortable with my appearance if I were in the presence of the Lord? End of quote. Chapter 1, verse 28, the phrase, They did establish the affairs of the church. President James E. Faust, the first president, explained that establishing the Lord's church requires more than just performing baptisms. Quote, We recognize that the process of establishing the Lord's church encompasses much more than baptizing people. In the first chapter of Alma, in the Book of Mormon, we find an instructive sequence of events outlining the way the by which the Lord's church is established. Let us take note of this process. First, the doctrines are taught. Second, members esteem each other as themselves. Third, they all labor, they work and earn that which they receive. Fourth, they are part of the they imparted their substance to the less fortunate. They serve one another. Fifth, they discipline their own appetites while at the same time caring appropriately for the needs of others. This mighty change happened not because the people were given things, but rather because they taught and began to help themselves and to care for those who were less fortunate. It was when they gave of themselves in the Lord's way that their circumstances began to improve. This process of establishing a church can apply anywhere. And, end of quote. Chapter 1, verses 29 through 31, the phrase, They began to be exceedingly rich, having abundance of all things whatsoever they stood in need, and thus they did prosper. One of the ways in which the Almighty prospered his people is through blessing them with abundance of this world's goods, with flocks and herds and lands and fruits of the fields. But this is only one way. The saints need not be confused or disappointed on this matter. When a people pay their tithing with faithfulness, God may choose to prosper them, prosper them with money or property, but he may instead open the windows of heaven and pour down revelation, knowledge from on high. In the days of Nephi and Lehi, the sons of Helaman, the Lord prospered the people of his fold, of his fold through church growth. And it came to pass that in the same year there was seemingly great prosperity in the church, insomuch that there were thousands who did join themselves in the church and were baptized into repentance. And so great was the prosperity of the church, and so many the blessings which were poured out upon the people, that even the high priests and the teachers were themselves astonished beyond measure. The perennial, perennial, the per, per, perennial, perennial, promise in the Book of Mormon is that if the people keep the commandments of God, they shall prosper in the land. 
If they do not keep the commandments, they shall be cut off from his presence. The latter expression, the warning, may well define more than any other statement that the Lord means in regard to prosperity. We are prospered when we enjoy his spirit and feel his presence. So do not think that that promise is just meaning you'll get worldly wealth or riches. It has other meanings as well. Chapter 1, verse 30, the phrase, therefore, they were liberal to all, wherefore, out of the church or in the church, whether out of the church or in the church, meant we are human beings, Christians as well as Latter-day Saints. Our Heavenly Father loves his sons and daughters throughout the church, no matter what the, are their religious persuasions, and so must we. Truly, there are limits to what we can do, and certainly all things must be done in wisdom and order. And yet again, that there are millions of hungry and naked and destitute souls in the world. How are disciples of Christ to live with themselves? How are we to handle the fact that there is only so much we can do, only so, much, so many we can assist and still manage to care for our own? If every family contributed regularly to every need cause, there would be insufficient money for the family to live. If every Christian man or woman gave themselves constantly to the every project designed to alleviate suffering, there would be no time to earn a living or care for their own. True disciples pray for discernment and for dis discretion. They seek to be as generous in giving as is appropriate and practical, even when we are not in a position to contribute dramatically to the alleviation of hunger in Africa or India, for example. There is still something we can do, something vital for those who aspire to discipleship. We can afford Avoid, as we would a plague, the tendency to be indifferent, to ignore the problem because it is not in our own backyards. Further, we can teach our family or friends by precept and by example to use wisely the food and other resources we have been blessed to have. Even if we just become aware of suffering and pain, our heightened sensitivity helps us to deal more tenderly, more charitably, with sufferers within our own limited reach. At least those are starting points. We will not be able to alleviate everything. And so we pray for the Spirit to direct us in what we can do and still take care of our own. Chapter 1, verse 32, the phrase, those who did not belong to their church did indulge themselves, being lifted up in their, in their own eyes. Referred to, Nephi had taught some 500 years earlier, Behold, the Lord esteemeth all flesh in one, but he that is righteous is favored of God, and he loveth those whom he will, who will have him to be their God. Those who revel in the works of the flesh may profit in regard to the items of exchange in this celestial tenement, but their prosperity is temporal and their joy but for a season. For example, of the self-appointed teachers produce a spirit of idleness in their churches and their members become full of devices to enable them to live without honest toil. They gave way to sorcery, idolatry, to robbery and murder and to all manner of wickedness for which offenses they were punished according to the law, whether conviction was obtained and also when the intent of the law was not thwarted by their unholy combinations. This development of precrafts also gave rise to another evil. Many belonging to apostate churches, though not willing to openly plunder or murder for gain, were anxious for a monarchy to be established, that thereby they might be appointed office holders, etc., and by taxes maintain themselves in plenty. Their hope and intention was to destroy the church of God, and undoubtedly to despoil its members. Boy, brothers and sisters, does that fit today? We have people who run for office so that they may raise taxes, so that they may gain the spoils of the taxes and reward of government money. If you voted for such a person, you are just as guilty as they are. Your vote is saying that you approve of what they're doing. Again, be careful who and what you vote for. Let's now go to Alma chapter 2. After two verses, one through thirty-eight, was a certain man being called Amlasai, 
The spirit of Nevehor lives on. Priestcraft and deceit and murder continue to rise their ugly head because Amosai, a very cunning man, yea, a wise man as to the wisdom of the world, applies his craft and thereby gains the sport of the wayward or the undiscerning. He defines the canons of both church and state. He defies the canons of both church and state. He seeks to destroy the church of God and to achieve monarchical power, contrary to the voice of the people and the prescribed systems of judgment. Amlesi arms his followers, leads them against the Nephites, and is, is consistently the case with the centers from the true order of worship among the Nephites, joins hands with the Lamanites. The development of priestcraft among the Nephites also gives rise to another evil. Many of those who belonged to the apostate church were not willing to openly plunder or murder for gain, but they were anxious that a monarch be established, that they might be appointed to offices, such as therein would be provided would be provided by flattering themselves upon public coffers so that they could use the government money and enrich themselves a government money. Brothers and sisters, we need to be careful of those today who seek to destroy the Constitution. There are elements in governments today, and I would say the current administration seek to destroy the Constitution and have done things that are blatantly against the Constitution. We must be careful who we vote for. If you voted for those who are blatantly abusing and defiling the Constitution that God has inspired and is Scripture, then you are just as accountable for the destruction of this nation as they are. Amosai's attempt to deprive the people of their religious rights and privileges was defeated by the voice of the people. Consider the results if righteous Nephites in Amosai's day had, ab had abstained from voting. In the democratic nations of our day, every Latter-day Saint has a sacred obligation to vote and to influence his or her society for good by upholding honest, wise, good, and honorable leaders and laws. You, we must vote for those who will uphold the Constitution. That is how you judge. That is who you vote for. Elder M. Russell Ballard, a quorum of the Twelve Apostles, encouraged us to raise our voices against the wicked trends in our day. Quote, we need to remember Edmund Burke's statement, the only thing necessary for triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. We need to raise our voices with other concerned citizens throughout the world in opposition to current trends. We need to tell the sponsors of offensive media that we have had enough. We need to sponsor programs and produ products that are positive and uplifting, joining together with neighbors and friends who share our concerns. We can send a clear message to those responsible. The internet websites and their local affiliates will have their addresses, letters, and email have more effect than most people realize. End of quote. This should have ended the matter, but it did not. The turbulent minority incited by Amosai would not accept this constitutional decision. They assembled and crowned their favorite as their favorite as king of the Nephites, and he at once began to prepare for war that he might force the rest of the people to accept him to be their ruler. Nor was Alma idle. He too made ready for the impending struggle. He gathers people and armed them with all weapons known to the Nephite warfare. The two camps were known as Nephites and as Amlicites, and their arms and their members of which had but a short time before dwelt together as brethren, marched against each other, and met near a hill called Amnihu on the bank of the river Sidon. There a bloody battle was fought in which Amlicite forces were badly defeated with the loss of 12,532 men, while the victorious had to mourn the loss of 6,562 warriors slain, all because they voted for pride, to uphold pride and priestcraft. As is the custom of those who apostatize from the truth and join with the world, Amosai and his people join with the Lamanites to battle the Nephites and destroy their, religion, their rights, religion, and liberty. 
Previously, the Lord had promised the Nephites that he would sustain them against the Lamanites if they were righteous. Consequently, in the time of their greatest need, the Nephites called upon God and were strengthened by the hand of the Lord. During the same battle, God strengthened Alma with the ability to defeat his enemies in response to his faith. Just like the Nephites, today we too face many battles with the adversary in this fallen to this world that are incited by many Amlicites who cause dissension in the church or in our, you could say, in our government too. If we are going to win this war, Satan started in the pre-existence to defeat our own Amlicites, then we will need the grace and power of the Savior that comes only to those who call on his name and follow his ways. We now turn to Alma chapter 3. Chapter 3 verse 4. The Amlicites were distinguished from the Nephites, for they had marked themselves with red in their foreheads. That phrase meant the Amlicites marked themselves with red in their forehead to distinguish themselves from the Nephites. In our time, President Gordon B. Hinckley admonished young men and women to keep their bodies sacred by not marking themselves with tattoos. Now, quote, now comes the craze of tattooing everyone's body, or tattooing one's body. I cannot understand why any young man or young woman, for that matter, would wish to undergo the painful process of disfiguring the skin with various multicolored representations of people, animals, and various symbols. With tattoos, the process is permanent unless there is another painful and costly undertaking to remove it. Fathers, caution your sons against having their bodies tattooed. They may resist your talk now, but the time will come when they will thank you. A tattoo is graffiti on the temple of the body. That is from a prophet of God. Likewise, he continues, the person of the body for multiple rings in the ears and the nose, even in the tongue. Can they possibly think this is beautiful? The first presence in the Quorum of the Twelve had declared that we discourage tattoos and also the piercing of the body for other, for other than medical purposes. We do not, however, take any position on minimal piercing of ears by women for one pair of earrings, one pair. End of quote. Chapter five, 33, verse 5, the phrase the Amalekites changed their appearance to follow the Lamanites. The Amalekites changed their appearance to look like the Lamanites. Many Latter-day Saints feel pressure to follow the dress trends of the world. Extreme in clothing and appearance serve to distinguish the obedient from the disciples of Jesus Christ. Those who follow these worldly trends disobey the prophet and instead follow the fads of the world. You can see why these chapters were put in here. We are seeing the same things today. Elder M. Russell Ballard taught young men who hold the priesthood that worldly trends in dress and appearance will chase away the spirit of the world. Quote, there is an entire subculture that celebrates contemporary gangs and their criminal conduct with music, clothing styles, language attitudes, and behavior. Many of you have watched as trendy friends have embraced a style as something that was fashionable and cool only to be dragged into the subculture. I do not believe that you can stand for truth and right while wearing anything that is unbecoming one who holds the priesthood of God. End of quote. That is an apostle of God stating the word of God as if Christ said it himself. May we have been warned. Chapter 3, verses 4 through 10, and then verses 13 through 19, the phrase, what is meant by a skin of blackness? Now listen, as I got a lengthy dis discourse on maybe what this skin of blackness refers to. That it may not refer to an actual skin color for as far as a race is concerned. It is not a racial component. William H. Douglas, on a blog that he wrote, gives some interesting insights into the meaning of a skin of blackness, referring to the Lamanite curse given by God for their rebellion in an article posted on January 29th, the year 2022. And then I have given you their, the website address. Here are some great remarks he makes 
we seem to think it only refers to a blackness of skin, meaning the pigment of your skin. Here is what he now states. The most quoted scripture about God cursing the Lamanites with the skin of blackness is in 2 Nephi 5, 19-23, which reads, And he had caused the cursing to come upon them, yea, even a sore cursing, because of their iniquity. For behold, they had hardened their hearts against him, that they had become like unto flint. Wherefore, as they were white and exceedingly fair and delightsome, that they may not be enticing unto my people, the Lord did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. And thus saith the Lord God, I will cause that they shall be loathsome unto thy people, say they shall repent of their iniquities. And the curse shall be the seed of him that mixeth with their seed, for they shall be cursed even with the same curse. And the Lord spake it, and it was done. But this is not the only reference to the Lamanite curse and God marking them in the Book of Mormon. The next reference comes from Alma chapter 3, verses 4 through 10, and then 13 through 19. In the previous chapter, Alma 2, a group of Nephites break away and start calling themselves the Amlicites that we just learned about. In Alma 3, these Amalekites join the Lamanites to team up in a war against the Nephites regarding them and mark themselves. And the Lamanite text reads, so here's what it says in Alma 4, 3, 4 through 10. And the Lamanites were distinguished from the Nephites, for they had marked themselves with red in their foreheads after the manner of the Lamanites. So they put a red mark on their foreheads. Nevertheless, they had not shorn their heads like unto the Lamanites. Now the heads of the Lamanites were shorn, and they were naked, save it were skin, which was girded about their loins. I Meaning they had a, a, a loin, a skin, an animal skin that covered their loins, and also their armor which was girded about them, and their bows and arrows, and their s stones, and their slings, and so forth. And the skins of the Lamanites were dark, according to the mark which was set upon their fathers, which was a curse upon them because of their transgression and their rebellion against their brethren, who consisted of Nephi, Jacob, Joseph, and Sam, who were just and holy men. And their brethren sought to destroy them. Therefore they were cursed, and the Lord set a mark upon them, yea, upon Laman and Laman, and also upon Ish, sons of Ishmael and Ishmaelitish women. And this was done that their seed might be distinguished from the seed of their brethren, that thereby the Lord God might preserve their people, that they might not mix and believe in incorrect traditions which would prove their destruction. And it came to pass that whosoever did mingle his seed with that of the seed, the that of the Lamanites did bring the same curse upon them. Therefore, whosoever suffered himself to be led away by the Lamanites was called under that head, and there was a mark set upon them. Verse 13 now. Now we will return again to the Amalekites, for they had a, a mark set upon them. Yea, they set the mark upon themselves, even a mark of red upon their foreheads. Verse 14. Thus the Lord God, thus the word of the Lord God is fulfilled. For these are the words which he said, Behold, Nephi, to Nephi, behold, the Lamanites have I cursed, and I will set a mark on them, that they and their seed may be separated from thee and thy seed from this time henceforth and forever, except they repent and their wickedness and turn unto me, and I may have mercy upon them. And again, I will set a mark upon him that mingles his seed with their brethren, that they may also be cursed also. And again, I set a mark upon him that fighteth against thee and thy seed. And again, I say, he that departeth from thee shall no more be called by thy seed, and I will bless thee, and whomsoever shall be called thy seed henceforth and forever. And these were the promises of the Lord unto Nephi and to his seed." Now the Amlicites knew not that they were fulfilling the words of God when they began to mark themselves in their foreheads. Remember it said, like the Lamanites. So it sounds like back in Nephi when he talks about the curse that they marked, they put them on themselves, was on the forehead too. 
when they began to mark themselves in the forehead. Nevertheless, they had come out in open rebellion against God. Therefore, it is expedient that the curse should fall upon them. Now I would that ye should see that they brought upon themselves the curse. And even so doth every man that is cursed bring upon himself his own condemnation. So this is the other reference to the skin of blackness that is a part of the curse, is here in Alma that we just read. Before going forward, this is now, this author, David, that I am quoting, before going forward to discuss what these verses say about whether we should interpret the skin of blackness literally, metaphorically, or both, there is one thing we can quickly dismiss. Read together, these verses make it clear that the Book of Mormon is not talking about racial characteristics. The Lamanites did not racially become black, red, or darker. Their actual skin did not change color. How can we determine this? Well, admittedly, the second Nephi reference could lead one to think the curse was a literal change in the skin color. Nephi doesn't actually explain what is happening in any detail, and therefore it is easier to assume a Penelope of possibilities, including a literal racial change in skin color. But the detailed explanation of the curse given in Alma makes this assumption literally impossible. So Nephi doesn't really explain what the skin of blackness means. In Alma, we get a better explanation. Here we go. Why? Because the Amlicites mark is equated with the Lamanite mark. The Amlicites mark themselves in their foreheads with a red mark after the manner of the Lamanites. So clear back in 2 Nephi, 1 Nephi, when the mark is brought up, that means the Lamanites mark themselves on their forehead. They put a mark of possibly red. Because the Amlicites mingled their seed with the seed of the Lamanites, the Amlicites became marked with the same mark the Lamanites were marked with. So if it's the same, the Lamanites put a red mark. The Amlicites now do the same marking. But with the Amlicites, we know this couldn't be a racial identifier or caused by racial intermarriage because the Amlicites had just had literally just allied with the Lamanites the chapter before. They haven't had time to intermarry and racially intermix and therefore have mixed race, darker skinned children. But they do have the Lamanite marking. Therefore, it cannot be racial. That can be ruled out. The black skin is not a racial determination. This, these quotes in Alma confirm that. In fact, the tax curiously says that the Amlicites marked themselves in Alma 3.13 and then immediately turns around in Alma 3.14-15 through 15 to have God claim he marked them. This seems to be a clear case of the Lord showing the wicked will fulfill his word even as they try and rebel against him. So the Amosites marking themselves is the same thing as if God had marked them. They fulfilled the word. Alma 3, 18-19 even says that the Amosites marking themselves fulfilled the prophecy that those who joined the Lamanites would be marked like them, which implicitly equates it to the Lamanite curse and skin of blackness from 2 Nephi 5, 20-21. Notice here that it gets very specific in saying the curse and the mark have fallen upon the Amlicites, not just, not just a curse or a mark. That is to make clear that the Amlicites have the Lamanite curse and the Lamanite mark because they have joined the Lamanites, even though they have not yet intermarried with the Lamanites. Some might counter this by arguing that God can make your skin color be whatever he wants it to be, so the Amlicites could become black without needing to intermarry. But Alma 3 also tells exactly what the dark mark upon the Amlicites was. Consequently, since we know that the Amlicites had the same mark as the Lamanites, it also tells us the nature of the Lamanite mark. 
Alma 3.4 tells us that the Lamanites had marked themselves with red in their foreheads after the manner of the Lamanites. That was the sign of the Lamanite curse, that God marked the Lamanites with a red mark on their forehead. So Alma gives us the detail. The mark wasn't their skin turned black. They marked themselves with the red marking on their foreheads. And the Amalekites copied it. Back to this David. In this context, it is worth remembering that the Gadiant robbers, when going to battle, dyed themselves in blood. Here again, we see another Nephite breakaway group going to war against the Nephites and physically marking themselves on their skins to show their apostate and antagonistic status. And how are they marked? They're covered and dyed in blood, which is red. The connection with the Amosites here is simply too strong to ignore. Again, we see a people apostatizing from the ways of the Lord. Again, we see people marking themselves in fulfillment of the of prophecy and God's work to distinguish between themselves and the Nephites. Again, the marking themselves in red, explicitly with blood here. And not inconsequently, when blood dries, it becomes darker, it turns black. So the mark on their forehead would be black. They would have a black mark on their skin. Now back to this David wounds. It may even be that when the Amalekites marked themselves with the red mark on their forehead, what they were doing was marking themselves with blood. Once more, we see the connection between a physical mark on the skin that is red, but could also be called black eventually. That, that could also be called black eventually. That isn't racial in nature. So why do we keep insisting that the Lamanite one must have been when one of the other example of God's prophecies being were f fulfilled were. Why do we keep insisting that it's their whole skin is turned black when it's not that case in the case of the Amalekites? To those who say, but in 2 Nephi, we see God claim that he was marking the Lamanites, not the Lamanites were marking themselves. Remember that Alma 3, 13, 16 says that even though the Amalekites were marking themselves, it was actually God marking them and setting them apart. See, that could be the exact same thing. The Lamanites marked themselves and it's the same thing as if God did it. The same is obviously true of the Lamanites. They had marked themselves with the red mark, but by doing so, they were only fulfilling God's word. So it was really God marking the Lamanites. God marked the Amalekites just as he had marked the Lamanites by allowing them to openly proclaim their apostasy, by marking themselves with the red mark that distinguished them from the covenant-keeping Nephites. It was not an actual change of skin tone or skin color. It is not racist. That still leaves us with the question of what the skin of blackness actually was and what it meant for the Lamanites and those who joined them to have it. In trying to answer that question, we could argue over whether it was literal or metaphorical, but the strongest argument is that it was both. It has symbolic and metaphorical dimensions that describes the spiritual condition the Lamanites in as a result of their culture and traditions. It is literal as the skin of blackness was an actual marking that the Lamanites marked themselves with that had powerful symbolic meaning and made them stand out as a people who were not followers of God and therefore people who could not partake of his covenant. Being cut off from the Abrahamic covenant was a curse that denied them many of the great blessings of God, including salvation and eternal life. And I also include the priesthood. They were cut off from that. Dr. Armand L. Moss, professor of sociology and religious studies at Washington State University and author of All Abraham's Children, a magisterial work examining the role of minorities in LDS theology and history, shared this insight about the symbolic usage of color. In, quote, in modern colloquial English or American, we sometimes speak of people having thick or thin skins without intending any literal dermatolo dermatological meaning. Attributes of white versus black 
or dark skins could be read in a similar figurative manner, as they might have been by Joseph Smith himself. The reader, therefore, need not attribute racist intentions when the Book of Mormon uses such terms as dark or filthy versus white or pure, especially when racial traits such as skin color are not even explicitly mentioned, which is the case most of the time. End of Dr. Moss's quote. When looked at symbolically, and without the baggage of American race relations thrust upon it by the well-meaning but ignorant, the symbolism of a duck skin of blackness has a deep and metaphorical richness to it that need not be no more literal than the rebellious and proud having literal stiff necks or literally hard hearts. In his book about scripture symbolism titled The Lost Language of Symbolism, Dr. Alonzo L. Gaskill, a professor of church history at BYU with specialties in scriptural and temporal symbolism, goes into detail about the symbolic meaning of the color black. He explains that black is symbolically associated with negativity, sin, evil, and death, judgment, premortal darkness, corruption, destruction, and sadness, as well as death by famine, plague, and pestilence. Further, it is specifically associated with the darkness of death, ignorance, despair, sorrow, and evil. Black is also the symbol of God's judgment upon the wicked, sinful, and evil. Do these meanings not relate to the Lamanites, especially as they appear in 2 Nephi and Alma? Laman and Lamiel, the founders of the Lamanite society, had rejected God and the prophetic counsel, not just their younger brother Nephi, but also their father Lehi. Repeatedly, the Book of Mormon laments the wicked traditions of the Lamanite fathers that kept the Lamanite society in spiritual bondage. By teaching them all, Nephites were liars, murderers, thieves who needed to be killed on sight, lest they corrupt and destroy Lamanite society in their lives. See Mosiah 10, 11 through 18 and Alma 28 through 16 for just two examples. They were a people who were lost in sin and darkness and spiritual destruction, a people whom the color symbolism of darkness describes perfectly. So having a markness of darkness also describes the darkness of their traditions and teachings and their apostate nature. Further, when we look at the writings of Jeremiah, who would have been a contemporary of Lehi and his son Nephi, we see the symbolic use of a skin of blackness in just the same way. In Lamentations 5, 7 through 10, we see the children of Israel describe their condition after having been destroyed for their witness of their ancestors. Jeremiah says, quote, Our fathers have sinned and are not, and we have borne their iniquities. Servants rule over us. There is none to deliver us out of their hand. We get our bread with the pell of our lives because of the sword of the, the sword of the wilderness. Our skin is black like an oven because of the burning heat of famine. Here we see a skin of blackness used metaphorically to describe the wretched condition the Israelites find themselves in being ruled by foreigners. The next quotation from Lamentations 4, 6, 8 is an even more powerful parallel to the Book of Mormon. Jeremiah says in Lamentations 6, For the chastisement of the daughter of my people have been greater than the punishment of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment, and no hands were wrung for her. Verse 7, Her princes were purer than snow, whiter than milk. Their bodies were more red ruddy than coral, and the beauty of their form was like sapphire. Verse 8, Now their face is blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones as it had become dry as wood. In the Lamentations of Jeremiah, we find a contemporary writer to Lehi and Nephi from their culture and their city they lived in using the exact kind of symbolism. Nephi later used to describe the Nephites in 2 Nephi 5, 19-25 when he says, The Lamanites went from being a white and delightsome people to being cursed and having a skin of darkness. 
The princes of Israel are described by Jeremiah as being purer than snow and whiter than milk. In other words, as white as white can be. Yet after they are cursed because of their evils with the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of a foreign power, these same princes are now blacker than soot. In other words, as black as black possibly can be. Jeremiah even uses his symbolism to describe himself when in the depth of sorrow he, dis he declares, For the hurt of the daughters of my people, I am hurt. I am black. Isn't that interesting? This is a contemporary writer. Jeremiah and Lehi were prophets together. And here Jeremiah is using the same, having a skin of blackness as meaning metaphorical. They had a a mark of blackness on them that was on their skin, but it wasn't a racial identity. They didn't have a whole, their whole bodies were not skins of blackness. Continuing with this David Williams. Do we think Jeremiah's teaching that the skin of the princes of Israel literally changed color after Jerusalem was, was conquered? Did Jeremiah suddenly go from being Israelite, a Jewish man, to being a black man? Of course not. We understand that he is using black symbolically to describe either his depression and pain stemming from the consequences of sin and the punishments of God, or he is describing the pain and suffering of others for the same reasons. We recognize that he is not literally describing his own race, nor suggesting that his skin color or the skin color of the princes of Israel changed color. Then why do we insist that the Nephites must be? We understand that Jeremiah is using the symbolic meaning of the color white and black to describe the spiritual condition of the people of Nephi, or of Israel. Nephi is doing the same. We see this same symbolism in Jacob 3.8 when Nephi's brother Jacob explains that unless the Nephites repent, the skins of the Lamanites will be whiter than the Nephites. And in 3 Nephi 2.14-15 where we read of the Lamanites joining the Nephites, converting to the gospel, and their skins becoming white. None of this is a literal description of the race or skin lightning. These are symbolic descriptions of spiritual conditions the Lamanites were in because they have rejected the commandments of God. And what will happen to the Nephites if they do the same? You will become black. You will become apostate. If you become repentant and come to the fold of God and get on the covenant path, then you become white and delights them. You become pure and clean as a spiritual condition. Continuing David Williams. The description of the mark in Alma 3 as being red also affords deep symbolism. The fact that the Lamanites and the Amalekites mark themselves with red is a powerful marker of their brutality, violence, and murderous intent. Red, depending on its context, is either the color of sacrifice and atonement or war, bloodshed, and violent death, as well as Satan. The context here seems pretty clear that the association is supposed to be with the negative symbolism of red, since the people marking themselves with red are described as a cursed, treacherous, and apostate people. That they mark their foreheads is red in red tells us a great deal about who they are and what they want. In scripture, the forehead in the body part most associated is the body part most associated with a person's thoughts, beliefs, and desires. The most famous version of this symbolism comes from Revelation 3, 16-18, where the wicked who serve the devil bear this mark in their forehead, meaning their thoughts, their desires, their beliefs, and actions are wicked. And in Revelation 14, 1, where the righteous who serve Christ bear his mark in their foreheads. Do we really believe that Christ comes down and marks us in the church? No, we don't have any such thing. But it means in our foreheads, our thoughts, our desires are those of Christ. In both cases, the mark tells us who the mark follower, marked follow and serve. The Lamanites and Samalites marking their foreheads with red tells us that all their thoughts and desires were towards war, bloodshed, violence, and evil. As Dr. Gaskell explains, by marking their foreheads in red, they, sh they showed where their hearts were and that they truly loved the things of Satan rather than those of God. 
as this point, at this point, you may not be convinced that the skin of blackness was symbolic and not literal. Perhaps you didn't find the commentary in Alma 3 earlier completely convincing and still think that this still has something to do with literal skin. I can understand that. After all, this has been the major assumption of most Latter-day Saints for most of our history, and the weight of such a tradition can be heavy and hard to shake off. Here I want to present you some opinions about how the skin of blackness the Lamanites had could be literal and still not be racial in character. As we considered these examples, recall in Alma 3, 14-16, the Lord claims that the Almasites' marking of themselves is the same as his God's marking them, meaning the mark can be both something they choose to do themselves and a mark placed upon them by God. First, I want to refer back to Alma 3, verses 5 through 6. Now, verse 5, Now the heads of the Lamanites were shorn, and they were naked, save it were a skin which was girded about their loins. So, so they had an animal skin that was girded about them, and also their, their armor, and which was girded about them, and their bows and their arrows, their slows and their slings, and so forth. And the skins of the Lamanites were dark, according to the mark which was set upon their fathers, which was a curse upon them because of their transgression and their rebellion against their brothers who consisted of Nephi, Jacob, Joseph, and Sam, who were just and holy men. Historically, it seems like most readers treat these two back-to-back -back references to the Lamanite skins as separate. Verse with verse 5 describing how they dressed in animal skins, and verse 6 describing how the Lamanite's skin color was black. But what if that is wrong? What if the back-to-back -back references to the skins of the Lamanites ref re Lamanites reference the same thing, meaning the animal skin color clothing which the Lamanites wear is dark, not their actual skin. See, that's just as valid and probably a more valid interpretation. Verse 5 said, they wore skins of blackness about their loins. And then the next verse said the Lamanites had black skins. Yes, they had a black skin of animal skin about their loins. Read straightforward and in context, this makes a great deal of sense. There is exactly no reason to read these references as separate from one another, and every reason to read them together. Done so, we learn that the dark mark, the skin of blackness which was set upon the Lamanite fathers, is not a change in their human skin tone, but has to do with how they dressed in black animal skins. So they wore black animal skins. That's the black skinness that they wore. Look at this. Notice the central figure in black in this animal skin. This is from a Mayan vase. You can see the eye holes, mouth hole, and hand holes where his natural skin color appears underneath. So see the two that are black? Notice how their hands and their face and their eyes are the regular skin color. Also, the figures in black may also be a black animal skin or painted as his feet and hands are different color than his face, though his face isn't. So in other words, they wore clothing, cloth, animal skins of black. Not that their skins were black. This certainly is evidence that the reference in Alma chapter 3 verses 5 and 6, when it says they wore a skin of blackness about their loins, and that the Lamanites had a dark skin of blackness, that they're referring to the clothing that they're wearing. Back to David Williams. Now, this may seem nonsensical to most Latter-day Saints at first, but I would urge them to pause and consider that this is not so silly when they realize that every temple endowed Latter-day Saint wears a pure white garment at all times that represents the animal skins placed upon Adam and Eve. Our garments, brothers and sisters, that we wear, 
are symbolic of the skin clothing placed on Adam and Eve. So the righteous have a white color of skin clothing. The wicked wear a dark color of skin clothing. That was placed on Adam and Eve by Jehovah. In a symbolic way, we wear white animal skins everywhere all the time. That's what our garments symbolize. It is so strange then to believe that the Lamanites did this. Is it so strange then to believe that the Lamanites did the same with black animal skins? Lamanite culture was formed by men who rejected their brother as a false prophet and asserted their own authority to rule in his stead, and who, devoid of the actual scriptures found upon the plates of brass, certainly passed down to their descendants a false and corrupt religion as well as false and corrupt traditions. Thus, while the Nephites had white skins that they wore, because they were temple people, the true temple garment and true temple practices, the Lamanites had black skins, meaning false temple garments and false temple practices. In this context, it is well worth noting that Second Nephi 5, 19-23 does not say that God changed the Lamanite skin color to black. Rather, it says he caused a skin of blackness to come upon them. Perhaps in the same way that he has a white garment come upon the Latter-day Saints in the temple. A skin of whiteness we wear. So he calls that a skin of blackness clothing came upon the Lamanites. The Lamanites attempts to falsify the truth. The Lamanites attempts to falsify the truth they lost in rejecting Nephites prophetic guidance and the introduction of different practices at odds with the law of Moses, corrupted their religion, sent them into apostasy, and cut them off from God. The text makes this clear by talking about how the Lamanites had black skins, black garments, as opposed to the Nephite white skin, white garments. In this context, it is also interesting to note that in both 2 Nephi 9.44 and Jacob 1.19, Jacob ends his sermon by saying that through his preaching, he has rid his garments of the blood and the sins of those to whom he has preached. As with the, La as with the Amlicites and Gadiant robbers, we again see the color red emerge as the color of skin that stains the garments of a person. And note that red, if left to it to sit, stay in a stained garment, will eventually turn black. The Nephite skin garments were white because they, like Jacob, have the blood and the sins of this generation cleansed from them through the atonement of Jesus Christ. The Lamanite skin garments are black because they have abandoned the covenants, forgotten the atonement, and do not repent of their sins. This brings upon them the curse of damnation and separation from God and the holy ordinance of ex exaltation as found in the temple. I want to acknowledge my indebtedness to Dr. Ethan Sprout of his excellent essay about the Lamanite skin of blackness and the way the language surrounding it is related to temp worship, not a literal change in skin color. His article is very much worth the time to read. Uh, and if you go to the website that I gave you where this article is found, you can read where he references this doctor's uh, article. William Douglas makes some compelling arguments of how the Lamanites were cursed with a dark skin without it referring to a literal change in skin color or having anything to do with race. I would suggest that his interpretation is correct. Just as we wear white garments, we wear white skin representing animal skins upon us because we go through the temple that are representative of Adam and Eve having animal skins. We wear white. The Nephites decided to have black animal skins that they wore on their bodies. Animal skins that were black. Their clothing, which represented their apostate condition. That makes more sense than this being any racial thing. And so when it says that if the Lamanites repent, that their 
skins can become white. Yes, they can repent, go to the temple, and then put on the white animal skin garment of righteousness. Chapter 3, verse 26 through 27. The phrase, every man receiveth wages of him whom he listeth to obey, meant the phrase, every man receiveth wages of him whom he listeth to obey, figuratively invites the reader to consider himself as an employee who cho whose choices determine whether his ultimate employer is God or Satan. In this context, the word list refers to learning or title tilting to one side or another. Therefore, those who tilt or lean towards Satan soon find themselves employed by him and receive eternal misery, because that's all he has to offer. Eventually, the choices of a lifetime will eventually will reveal whom one has chosen as an eternal employer. President Boyd K. Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve, taught this truth when he declared, quote, Our lives are made up of thousands of everyday choices. Over the years, these little choices will be bundled together and show clearly what we value. End of quote. Let's now finish up Alma chapter 4. Chapter 4, verses 4 through 5, the phrase to establish the church more fully meant, on the one hand, the church began to be established more fully in the hearts and minds of the members. On the other hand, it began to have an influence on those not of the faith, such that as one year 3,500 persons came unto Christ through repentance and baptism. Though the record says that the converts were baptized by the hand of Alma, we would suppose that many were baptized by other legal administrators under Alma's direction by virtue of the keys of the priest that he held as president of the church or presiding high priest. Chapter 4, verses 6 through 9, the phrase, The people of the church began to wax proud. In describing the reasons for the fall of the Nephite nation, Mormon got to the heart of the matter. Behold, he wrote to his son Moroni, The pride of this nation, or the people of the Nephites, have proven their destruction, except they should repent. Of course they did not repent, and they fell. It was of this fall that the Lord spoke in modern revelation, Doctrine and Covenants 38, And if ye seek the riches which it is the will of the Father to give you, ye shall be given riches of all the people. For ye, shall have, for ye shall have the riches of eternity, and it must needs be that the riches of the earth are mine to give. But beware of pride, lest ye become as the Nephites of old. In other words, someday, brothers and sisters, we have to learn how to be rich and, not, and, and stay humble. Because God is wealthy and not prideful. Someday we have to learn that balance. President Ezra Taft Benson called pride, quote, the universal sin. The great vice. Further, he said, pride is the great stumbling block of Zion. He further quotes, the central feature of pride, President Benson exclaimed, is enmity. Enmity towards God and enmity towards our fellow man. Enmity means hatred towards hostility or state of opposition. It is the power by which Satan wishes to reign over us. Pride is essentially competitive in nature. We pit our will against God's. In addition, the proud make every man their adversary by pitting their intel, int, in, intellects, opinions, words, wealth, talents, or any other worldly measures device against others. President Benson warned, God will have a humble people. We can either choose to be humble or, or we can be compelled to be humble. If you read the scriptures about God's judgments and what he can do, brothers and sisters, I would choose to be humble, not compelled. Chapter 4, verse 8, the phrase, they began to be scornful one towards another. C.S. Lewis wrote, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. When a, per when a person spends all of his time looking over, comparing and contrasting himself with others, rather than looking up to Christ, he will soon gr grieve the spirit of Christ and thus alienate the very power by which relationships are sweetened and sustained. Rather than being filled with love, he is filled with suspicion or resentment. Resentment tends to lead eventually to persecution. Chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, a great stumbling block meant, as church members became proud, their negative examples became a stumbling block to those who did not belong to the church. President Gorham B. Hinckley related the story of a young man who faced terrible odds to learn about the gospel because of the way church members treated him. Quote, he was not a member of the church. He and his 
he and his parents were active in another faith. He recalls that when he was growing up, some of the LDS associates belittled him, made him feel out of place, and poked fun at him. He came to literally hate this church and its people. He saw no good in any of them. Then his father lost his employment and had to move. In the new location at age 17, he was able to enroll in college. There, for the first time in his life, he felt the warmth of friends, one of whom was Richard, asked him to join a club of which he was president. He writes, For the first time in my life, someone wanted me around. I didn't know how to react, but thankfully I joined. It was a feeling that I loved, the feeling of having a friend. I had prayed for one my whole life, and now, after 17 years of waiting, God answered that prayer. At the age of 19, he found himself as a tent partner with Richard during their summer employment. He noticed Richard reading a book every night. He asked what he was reading. He was told that he was reading the Book of Mormon. He adds, I quickly changed the subject and went to bed. After all, that is the book that ruined my childhood. I tried forgetting about it, but that week went by and I couldn't sleep. Why was he reading it every night? I soon couldn't stand the unanswered questions in my head. So one night I asked him, what was so important in that book? What was in it? He started to read where he had stopped. He read about Jesus and about the appearance in the Americas. I was shocked. I didn't think the Mormons believed in Jesus. On a subsequent occasion, this young man and his friends were traveling. Richard handed him a book of Mormon and asked him to read it out loud. He did so, and suddenly the inspiration of the Holy Spirit touched him. Time passed, and his faith increased. He agreed to be baptized. That is the end of the story. But there are great statements in that story. One is the sorry manner in which this young associate, the, the, one is the sorry manner in which his young Mormon associates treated him. Next is the manner in which his newfound friend Richard treated him. It was totally opposite with previous experience. It led to his conversion and baptism in the face of terrible odds. End of quote. Brothers and sisters, are you and I a stepping stone to help people come into this church, or are we a stumbling block because of the way we treat them? Chapter 14, 34, verse 13, the phrase, while others were abasing themselves, meant one need not submit to either the blatant evil or the perverse or the subtle persuasion of the sly. Indeed, the Book of Mormon's powerful witness to the fact that one can live a life of fidelity and devotion in the midst of pride and priestcraft and greed and persecution. So it was that while some who claimed membership in the church in Alma's day were untrue to their trust and reveled in their pride, others of the house of the faith stood firm and steadfast. They abased themselves. That is, they acknowledged that their prosperity was a gift from the Almighty and not a, simply a product of their own industry. Further, they acknowledged their need for divine assistance and realized their absolute worth nothingness without the Lord. They were, personal, they were personal witnesses of the fact that in all eternity, no person can come to God except he or she put off the carnal and fallen state and partake of the cleansing powers of the blood of Christ. Chapter 4, verse 14, the phrase retaining or remission of their sins refers to. The Book of Mormon not only teaches that through the atonement of Jesus Christ you can receive a remission of your sins, but it also teaches that you must retain a remission of your sins. You can see that now in the 4 in Mosiah 4. President Mary and G. Romney of the First Presidency taught that being true to our covenants and caring for others allows us to retain a remission of our sins. He said, quote, is there any doubt that retaining a remission of sins depends on our caring for one another? If we believe these teachings, if we, press, if we profess to follow the Savior and his prophets, if we want to be true to our covenants and have the Spirit of the Lord in our lives, then we must do the things that the Savior said and did. And that is caring and then helping others to retain a remission. Chapter 4, verse 15, the phrase, the Spirit of the Lord did not fail them. Living in trouble and sinful times many leads, may lead to some to despair. Others may conclude that little can be done to reform or, re, 
a reprobate world, and many therefore feel bitterness and animosity towards those who bring a stench and a stain upon humanity. Those saints who seek the influence of the cover will, however, take a different course. They will come to view the world as the Lord does. The Comforter will bring perspective. He will bring peace. He will bring rest in a turbulent world. Chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. The plight of the church seemed to dictate to Alma that he needed to focus his efforts and his strengths where they could be of the greatest benefit on the spiritual well-being of society. Inasmuch as the Nephite society was governed by the voice of the people, it appears that Alma made to the people a recommendation for his replacement and then sought their voice in that matter. They sustained Nephi as the second governor chief judge, while Alma continued and intensified his priestly labors as the as the president of the church, the chief high priest. Chapter 4, verse 9, bearing down in pure testimony, meant, in order to reclaim the people, Alma knew that the preaching of the word had a great tendency to lead the people to do which is just. Yea, it had a more powerful effect upon the minds of the people than the sword or anything else. Isn't that interesting? The preaching the world is more effective than being threatened with death. President Gordon B. Hinckley emphasized the world's need to hear pure testimony. Quote, you will recall that Alma gave up the judgment seat so that he might have time and strength for a greater work. For this same reason, the world today needs the power of pure testimony. It needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if the world is to hear that gospel, there must be messengers to teach it. End of quote. M, Elder M. Russell Ballard counseled Latter-day Saints to bear pure testimony. Quote, simply stated testimony, real testimony born of the Spirit and confirmed by the Holy Ghost changes lives. It changes how you think and what you do. It changes what you say. It affects every priority you set and every choice you make. My experience throughout the church leads me to worry that too many of our members' testimony linger on, I am thankful and I love, and too few are able to say with humble but sincerity, with sincere clarity, I know. As a result, our meetings sometimes lack the testimony-rich spiritual underpinnings that stir the soul and have meaningful positive impact on the lives of all those who hear them. Our testimony meeting need not be more need to be more centered on the Savior, the doctrine of the gospel, the doctrine of the restoration, and the teachings of the scriptures. We need to replace stories, travel logs, and lectures with pure testimony. To bear testimony is to bear witness by the power of the Holy Ghost to make a solemn declaration of truth based on personal knowledge or belief. Clear declaration of truth makes a difference in people's lives. That is what changes hearts. That is what the Holy Ghost can confirm in the hearts of children. Although we can have testimonies of many things as members of the church, there are basic truths we need to constantly teach one another and share with those not of our faith. Testify that God is the Father and Jesus is the Christ. The plan of salvation is centered on the plowment of Jesus Christ. Joseph Smith restored the fullness of the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ, and the Book of Mormon is evidence that our testimony is true. End of quote. I second my witness. Today, I heard many people say they were thankful for things, but very few bore a witness of the Savior and Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Ghost. We need to change that in our testimony meetings. President Howard W. Hunter offered a caution with regard to emotions and testimonies. Let me offer a word of caution on this subject. I get concerned when it appears that strong emotion or free-flowing tears are equated with the presence of the Spirit. Certainly, the Spirit of the Lord can bring strong emotional feelings, including tears, but that outward manifestation ought not be confused with the presence of the Spirit itself. I have watched a great many of my brethren over the years, and we have shared some rare and unspeakable spiritual experience together. Those experiences have all been different, each special in its own way, and such sacred moments may or may not be accompanied by tears. Very often they are, but sometimes they are accompanied by total silence. End of quote. 
The teacher's divine commission has been clearly articulated by the scriptures of my living prophets. He or she is to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is to be taught out of the standard works and from the words of the living oracles. It is to be taught by the power of the Holy Ghost. It is to be applied to the life situation and listeners, thus likening the scriptures unto the saints. Finally, and as the capstone of teaching of the teaching enterprise, the teachers to bear witness by the power of the Holy Ghost that what has been taught is true. Faith is developed and commitment is built as a result of testimony, pure and solid testimony. The Holy Ghost is a converter. The gospel teacher has much to do in the preparation of the lesson, the search of the scriptures, declaration of truth, but the Holy Ghost is the converter. And the gospel teacher must never forget this. He or she must never seek to usurp the role of the Spirit, nor upstage him whose influence results in renewal and righteousness. The person who bears pure testimony never seeks for cheap substitutes for the Spirit. He never relies upon methodologies, or I would say teaching methods, which might confuse sentimentality with spirituality, emotional display with edification. His witness is more than story. His testimony is more than expression of gratitude. He tries the virtue of the word of God, trust in the power of the scriptures and the words of the prophets to penetrate to the hearts of his listeners and bears witness of the message with sincerity and with soberness. Mormon explains that Alma determined to bear down a pure testament against the people. His expressions were not motivated by anger or spite, nor directed against the people in the spirit of condemnation. Rarely his heart, motivated by the pure love of Christ, was bent upon the saving their souls. He loved them and simply could not stand by and allow them to destroy themselves. Thank you for watching. I hope some of these insights helped you with the doctrines and principles and to become closer to Christ and to bear witness of his atonement and to rely more fully upon him who is mighty to save. If you, got, if you enjoyed the presentation, please hit the like button.